All right. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap this, this morning. You know, I, uh, I don't know about us here in Southern California if we're used to this cold weather. Because I'm sure not. <laughs> you know, but it's been, uh, it's been pretty cold. And, but, you know, this morning we're going, to, we're going to continue on the Christmas story today and Wednesday. And then Christmas Day we won't be having service, but it'll just be online. So you can watch it at 7. It's going to come on at 7. It'll come on at 9. It'll probably come on, you know, about 11. And uh, when you're there at home, you guys could just put it on and for the family. And, and uh, that way we could, you know, definitely have Christmas service. But we will definitely do that. That'll be just online on Christmas Day. It'll be once again at 7, at 9, and more than likely at 11. So um, with that, today we have... To this afternoon at 5 o'clock, we have our, our church banquet. And if you haven't gotten your ticket, I encourage you to get your ticket. We're going to have a good time. We really are. We have, a, we have food coming in. We have, um, uh, Pastor Teresa was out yesterday, her and Ruthie running around. And throughout the week, they have door prizes and just some prizes they're going to give. And we have a live band coming. And we have uh, uh, it's friends of um, Sal Rodriguez that plays with war. He will be with them also here with us today. So we're going to have just have a good time in, 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 as family this afternoon. It starts at 5 o'clock. So we encourage you to come on out. You can get with at the table outside. If you haven't purchased a ticket, you can get with somebody outside. I'm, I'm pretty sure they'll have it there. As we receive this morning of our, for our givings here for the, life, uh, for the Life Center, there's a very familiar scripture. And Pastor Teresa said something a while back that when she was reading Jeremiah 29 11 um, that God knows the plans that he has for us and what have you and she said the Lord spoke to her and and because she had looked at it as a familiar scripture and the Lord told her don't ever get familiar with my scriptures don't ever get so familiar with my word that you just sort of bypass it and I, I heard that when she said that and we must be very careful so today I'm going to give you a message, uh, 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 we're going to, our giving is from a very familiar scripture, and it's from John 3.16. It's a very powerful scripture, but it's a very familiar scripture. And it says this, for he is, the, for here is the way God loved the world. He gave his only unique son as a gift. Somebody say a gift. He gave his only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. You know, I spoke with somebody uh, yesterday, and they were telling me about the individual that had passed away in their life. And, you know, I was talking, he was talking about their father. And I was saying, you know, at the end of the day, you hurt. We hurt because we love them. When, when a loved one in our lives passes away, we love them and we hurt and it's deep. And, you know, I understand that deep pain. I personally do. I've lost my father. But there's two types of pain. There's, there's, there's something there that, that's of deep pain. But yet, God gave us this gift of everlasting life that we could stand and rest assured that, you know, anybody that believes, well, I still at times I'll think of my dad and I'll, cry and I'll remember things to the, and he's been gone 12 years now my dad how do you how do you sidestep that but what I do know the thing that always brings and I'm so grateful to God because what it brings me and what it brings us is salvation it brings us that we know and I know that my daddy is in the presence of God and this is the promise that God gives all of us he gave us the promise of everlasting life come on give the Lord a hand clap this morning if you need an envelope this morning, just raise your hand uh, in here, and the ushers will gladly put that into your hand. But he says, and then once you're done, uh, just raise your hand back, and they'll come by and grab it from you. But he says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's whosoever believeth him would have everlasting life, would not perish, but they would have everlasting life. You know, he gave his very best. God gave his very best for us. And I want you to know this, the principle of that 
is he gave his very best for what? For a reason. Guess what the reason was? The reason was you. The purpose for his giving was for you and I, that we would have everlasting life. Today, as you give, don't be afraid to pray over your giving. Would you give with a purpose? You know, Lord, I give from a grateful heart, but I also give that, that, that I'm going to believe that I'm going to see my children in the house of God. Lord, I give, I give out of my obedience, but I'm also believing for a good report from the doctor. Lord, I give, but I'm also believing for whatever area it is that you're believing God for. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. And I believe that we're able to do that. We're able to do that. You know, the beautiful thing is that God gave his, his when we're going to talk about that, he gave, his, he gave his very best. Matter of fact, God himself stepped out of heaven and wrapped flesh around himself and stepped into humanity for you and I. And, you know, let me not get ahead of myself this morning because, uh, Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for our jobs. We thank you for the finances that you give us. We thank you for bringing us through this last year, Father. And we thank you that we could have hope that no matter what comes our way that we're going to get through. So, Father, we thank you this morning. I pray for each person that's here. I ask you that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings that we would not be able to contain them. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. All right. May I have those, those notes, please? Thank you. All right. Thank you, Izzy. Let's do it, you guys. You guys ready? Have you, by, have you been good this year? Is God, is God going to bless you? You thought I was going to say if Santa's going to bring you something, huh? <laughs> Santa. Well, today, I want to, uh, uh, I'm going to start out, and I'm going to go over some of what I went over on Wednesday night. And the Christmas story is a beautiful story, and I was thinking about it today. It starts, and, and we're going to talk about a couple individuals, Elizabeth, Zechariah, Joseph and Mary, Gabriel and Jesus will be involved. We're mainly going to stay in the book of Luke this morning. The book of Luke's chapter 1, verse 5, the word of God says, and in, in, though, in the days when Herod was king of Judea, there was a certain priest whose name was Zechariah, and his wife's name was Elizabeth. Somebody say Elizabeth. And they both were righteous in the sight of God. In other words, they were in right standing with God. Say this. Say, I am, I am the righteousness of God. Righteousness of God. We, yes, we are. Come on, somebody. So they were both, both were righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and the requirements of the Lord. But they had no child, for Elizabeth was barren, and both were far advanced in years. But they had no child, and Elizabeth was barren, for they were both far advanced in years. When you read that, it was talking about Zechariah, and Zechariah was a priest, and, and he was tapped, his shoulder was tapped to go in and burn incense. If, if there, there was hundreds of priests, and if uh, not every priest got the opportunity to go into the temple. So it was a big deal for Zechariah to go into the temple. God touched him, and he, and, and he got called in there. The Bible says that they walked with God and that they were in, 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 in the sight of God, that they walked blamelessly, but they had an issue going on, that they didn't have no babies. It is understood that, that, that Elizabeth around this time was close to 70 years old, and she was, she, it, wasn't, it was only that she was barren, but they were far along in years. In other words, she couldn't conceive babies. That's why they didn't have any children. So there was the issue internally that was going on inside of her that she was not able to have babies. for. And, and in those days, it was a big deal to have a child. If you didn't have a child, you were looked at as if you were cursed. But the Bible says not only was she barren, but that they were, that they were old now. So there was things, it was all working against them. 
And then verse 11 says, And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was troubled, and fear took possession of him. Verse 13, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Do not be afraid, because your petition, your petition was heard. Because your petition was heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, or she will have a baby. Come on, somebody say that's good news. <laughs> and you must call his name John. You know, another translation, or the Greek word for that, I was reading in verse 13 where he says, Zechariah, fear not because your petition was heard. Another translation says, you know, you don't, the prayer that you don't even pray no more has been heard from God. The prayer that you stopped praying has been heard from God. So what is it telling us? It says that God spoke to Gabriel and he sent him down. He says, you, you may have stopped praying that prayer, but it doesn't mean that I didn't hear that prayer of yours because time, come on somebody, will take us away. And time had passed. He was 70 years old. And, and you, you know, who knows how long he wasn't praying it no more. But at least he prayed it. Come on, somebody. And that's a point for you and I. That it doesn't matter what you're in. You need to at least pray it. It may seem crazy. It may have not been working out. She may have had miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. Or she just couldn't get pregnant. But he kept believing. Come on, somebody. And somebody got to keep believing God. It says a prayer you don't pray, even pray anymore. God has heard it, and he has called you favorable, and you're going to have a baby. Come on, somebody, in your old age. It's never too late. Come on, say it. It's never too late. It's never too late. It ain't over until God says it's over. It ain't over until God says it's over. That might be for somebody this morning. It, may, it ain't over until God says it's over. No matter how it looks. And then Luke 18 says, And Zechariah said to the angel, By what shall I know and be sure of this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel replied to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God, and I have been sent to talk to you and to bring you this good news. And it goes on to say in verse 20, Now behold, you will be you will be and will continue to be silent and not be able to speak to the day when these things take place because you have not believed what I told you. But my words, this is what I want you to hear, but my words are of a kind which will be fulfilled in the appointed and proper time. It may not happen on your time, but it will definitely happen on God's time. And that's why we have to sometimes step out of our time clock. Our God is outside of time. Come on, somebody. And, and, and it may not happen when we want to happen, but everything will come true at the right time. So you keep believing. And he tells him here, because of your unbelief, Zechariah asked for a sign rather than believe the word of the Lord, and he was given the sign of silence unto himself. See, unbelief keeps one from speaking faith. When you walk in unbelief, you, you ain't speaking no faith. Come on, somebody. You, be, you become silent within yourself. God has never called us to be silent, no matter how it looks. And then Luke 1, says, Now after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. After he walked out and God told him and he came, finally came out, she becomes pregnant. And the beautiful thing about this is that that I didn't realize that I was telling Ruthie this yesterday, or, or I think I was telling her, that, that I didn't realize how long he was silent. You know, sometimes doubt and it could get you, and it could last for a while. He, he was silent for over nine months, probably ten months, because he couldn't speak until after when he had the baby, the baby was born, and they tried to call the baby Zechariah, and his wife said, no, 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 come on, woman of God, no, 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 his name ain't Zechariah, his name is John, and they asked, they asked uh, uh, Zechariah, what is his name, they give 
tablet. He writes his name John. Once he walked out in faith and he did what the angel of God told him to do, he was able to speak. And guess what his first words were? He started praising the Lord. Come on. He started thanking God. He started honoring God in the middle of it all. And the beautiful thing about Christmas that I see is that up until this time, God was silent for 400 years, Manny. For 400 years, the last time that he had spoke was in the book of Malachi. But for 400 years, you had the children of Israel that all they had to go by was their faith. Come on, somebody. Sometimes all you have to go by is your faith and is your belief that, you know what? God is still hearing my prayers. No matter how long it is, they hadn't heard a prophetic word in over 400 years. So what is that saying to you today? Just because you haven't heard something inside of you, you haven't got goosebumps or chicken skin or whatever you want to call it, doesn't mean that God isn't moving in your life. It doesn't mean that God is gone. They stayed in expectancy. They stayed on their tippy toes waiting to hear from God, no matter what. So you need to continue to expect, and you need to continue to live right. Right now is not the time to throw in the towel and to walk away, because you don't know when the angel of God is going to show up. Another thing that, is, that, that happens in that passage is that it's never too late. It's never too late. God, when God shows up after 400 years, who does he go to? He goes to one of the most impossible situations so that you and I could see what God could do. Come on, he didn't, he didn't need to go to a, 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 an old couple that were both barren that were in their 70s. But he went into, the, when he shows up to bring the Christmas story, the birth of Christ, he shows up in the most impossible situation. And now does that tell me that God from the beginning of, of when Jesus come, he came to show you and I that he is the God of the impossible. That he's the God of the impossible. It's never too late. So he says, fear not, your prayers are being heard. He tells Cornelius the same thing. Cornelius, today God is visiting you. He has heard your prayers and your alms to people, the good things that you have done for people. So the book of Galatians tells us, never tire and weary of doing good, for in due time you shall reap what you sow. Come on, somebody. You shall reap what you've been sowing. You're going to reap what you've been sowing. You may feel like I've been giving of my life. I've been forgiving over and over. I've been doing this. I've been doing that. Why well, you just keep doing it. Because the word of God shows us plainly that our God will never leave us high and dry, Moses. Never will he. He is the God of the impossible. He is the God of the impossible. Today, doubt and, and impossibilities and, and fear need to leave this room. Because the God of the impossible is here today and he's speaking to you that he is the God of the impossible. That he can do the possible. He can change situations around. And that he's a living God. We serve a real God. Isaiah, some 700 years prior to, 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 to Jesus showing up, prophetically spoke of it. 700 years. It wasn't at 2 o'clock in the morning on TBN, some guy saying it. This is 700 years. Isaiah saying Isaiah 40 verse 3 says, listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord, make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. He's speaking of John, John the Baptist, Elizabeth and Zechariah's son. Prior to that, he speaks of somebody that's going to go before Jesus and said the way. Is it warm in here? If it is, you guys, if they could put some air on for her. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> I go from being cold to being warm. You know, the word, the word of God is amazing, you guys. It truly is. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father of Eternity, the Prince of Peace. 700 years prior, Isaiah speaks of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. 
One day we're going to see this God that we serve. So don't you ever give up. Don't you ever walk away from him. Because he is who he says he is. Going down, going down into the book of Luke, I want to jump into a couple other individuals. One by the name of Joseph and another one by the name of Mary. That's all. This is all in the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1 verse 26. One of my favorite passages. And it says this. Now in the sixth month after that, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a town of Galilee named Nazareth. Now in the sixth month of what? In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. When Elizabeth was pregnant, when she was six months pregnant, Gabriel shows back up. In this time, Gabriel goes to the, to the town, to Galilee, uh, named Nazareth. And verse 7 says, To a girl never had been married, and a virgin engaged to be married to a man whose name was Joseph, a descendant of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and he said, Hail, O favored one. Hail, O favored one, endued with grace. The Lord is with you, blessed, favored of God are you before all other women. But when she saw him, she was greatly troubled and disturbed and confused at what he said, and it kept revolving in her mind what such a greeting might mean. What I want to say to you today is this. Earlier when I was talking about he's the God of the impossible, Earlier when I was talking about that, you know, that if he says something, that he's going to come through with it. You know, there's times we got to believe that, that, like Mary here, sometimes God will come and he'll just blow your mind. And he shows up to Mary and he starts telling her all this stuff. She was just a young girl. They believed that she was between the age of 12 and probably 17 years of age during this time when the angel comes. She was engaged to a man by the name of Joseph. And, and they, this engagement went on for a year. They weren't married yet, but they were, they were in the process of being married. But the Bible says that all of a sudden, the angel shows up and he says, Hey, you highly favored of God. Somebody say, I'm highly favored. Somebody say, I'm highly favored. He says, you highly favored of God. He says to him that, that this is what God is doing. He calls her this, and dude, by grace, the grace of God. He calls her blessed. But it says, but when God spoke to her, that she was troubled, and it disturbed, and it confused her. And, he said, and she said to herself, it kept revolving in her mind, what does this mean? And then in Luke, verse 1, chapter 30, he says, and the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found grace, favor, and loving kindness with God. And listen, you will become pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall call his name Jesus. You got to understand what's going on. This girl was just a peasant girl. She was just some girl in a small little town. She was a believer, but she was poor. She wasn't of... of, of high society, anything like that. But look, look look, at the goodness of God, what he does. After 400 years of silence, and he says it's time to get this ball rolling, the first one he shows up is to an old couple in their 70s that are barren, and he does a miracle in their life. And then he shows up to a girl, a young girl, come on somebody, that was engaged, that she had never been with a man before, and he come and he tells her something that was out of that, 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 that she couldn't even receive. It was beyond her. The God that you and I serve, he will drop dreams into your heart. And let me tell you something. They, if, if, if God drops something in your heart and you're able to do it on your own, then that's all you. But see, the God that I serve and the God that you serve will drop big dreams in your life that are beyond you, because when they happen, you're going to be able to look back and you're going to say, well, I know that was God, because there's no way I could have pulled that thing off myself. <laughs> and this is what she's doing with him here. This, this passage, I will tell you something. 
This passage, when I first got saved, is what put fire under me for, for at the very beginning, this passage. Because what did I do? And this is what you should do. You need to throw yourself right in the middle of this passage. You need to make yourself merry. Come on, somebody. You need to fall inside of there, and you need to know that God is speaking to you too. Because he tells her, he says, you know what? I'm going to do something crazy up in your life. And you need to hear that. If you allow God to do it, God could do something big in your life that's beyond you. And he goes and he says, you're going to become pregnant and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his forefather David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob throughout the ages and his reign there will be no end. I, but Gabriel probably was talking, and she was just probably going, because she's, he's dropping bombs on her. Because think about this. Let's look at it on another end, angle. First of all, she's thinking, wait, 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 wait. I'm getting married in a few months. You know, my daughter's getting married, and, and I hear them. They're talking about the flowers. They're talking about all these kinds of things. She wasn't thinking about all of that. She was probably thinking, you know what? I'm supposed to get married in a little bit. So you know what God does? God will come into your life, and he will disrupt your life. Because that's what he did to her. She was ready in believing that her life was going one way. But God said, you know what? I got something else for you. And what I got for you is going to challenge you. People are going to talk about you. And you ain't going to be able to have that little house with a dog with a white picket fence. Come on, somebody, because I have something bigger for you. She had to make a decision in this. There was a lot going on in there. So God disrupts her life. And then he tells her over here in verse 34, and Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have no intimacy with any man and a husband? The difference between her and Zechariah is that Zechariah brought doubt. She accepted it. She just didn't know how it was going to happen. Come on, somebody. She was like, okay, you're telling me I'm gonna, how is this supposed to happen? Explain to me how am I going to have a baby when I'm not even married yet. And the Bible tells us in verse 35, it says, Then the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you like a shining cloud. And so the Holy One thing which shall be born of you will be called the Son of God. In other words, Mary in other words, yourself. What God is going to do with us in our lives has nothing to do with us. Come on, somebody. It has with us accepting it, but understanding that the power of the Holy Spirit is the one that's going to endue us and give us the favor and everything else to complete and to do what we need to do. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with us receiving the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit will give you the wisdom to do what you have to do. That the Holy Spirit will bring the right people around you to accomplish all that you need to do. You know, uh, yesterday I was telling Ruthie. Ruthie was with us yesterday. I keep going back to Ruthie. She was around the house yesterday. And, um, but, but in the morning, the other day I went to uh, Juvenile Hall. And there was this, in the library there, the library at Juvenile Hall is called the Tom Wright Library. In, in honor of, of, of Director Tom Wright. Tom Wright was my probation officer way back when in the early 70s. He'd come to my house in a little Volkswagen when they had us on house arrest, all the guys in the neighborhood where I grew up in. And then as the years went by, this man went up, up, up with the county. He became the head director over all of the juvenile facilities, over all the camps, everything. And what happens is that when I finally went back to school, this man stayed in my life. See, God will supernaturally put the right people in your life, even when you're not the best that you could be. Because I met this man when I was not a good boy. I was definitely not a good boy. But I met this man, but God gave me favor with this gentleman. This man, this man liked me, and I cared for him. So years passed. I end up going to school and I end up getting my teaching credential. He'd been in my life. By that time, he'd gone all the way up the ladder. When I got my teaching credential, the first person I went to was Mr. Wright because I wanted to work in juvenile hall and work with troubled kids. And what did he do? He, he connected me directly 
with ROP in San Juan Capistrano and got me a job right away working up at Los Pinos Juvenile Facility up in Ortega Highway. Now, I'm going to tell you this. It's called favor. Come on, somebody. It's called favor, the favor of God. It's called the spirit of God moving into other people's life. So I tried to find out where he was, and they told me that he has uh, dementia now, but he's still alive. So the director that's the hall now texted me the other day and gave me his son's text. And I sent, <laughs> I sent his son a text. I said, your daddy believed in me. Your daddy helped me. And I know that he may not remember me, but you please tell your mama and your family that there's a grateful man over here that my family and other people have definitely benefited from the goodness of him that he did, what he did for me. And it's true. God will, because don't ever limit who you are. If I would have looked at Mary, if I would have looked at myself like Mary, like it don't make sense what I think God wants to do in my life, what I would like to do. You know what? Just believe God and just trust God. And just step out in faith. Because you never know. And it may not happen this week. And it may not happen next week. I rode the bus for six years. I would sit in the bus and I would look at the people in their car. And I will say, one day I'm going to be in my own car, man. <laughs> I was telling him. I was telling Ruth once again. That when I went to juvenile hall one time. Because he would let me go visit boys. And I went and I rode my bike because I didn't have a car. And I rode my bike from where we live to the juvenile hall to go visit a young boy. And when I was in there, one of the counselors in there, I heard him say, man, they just let anybody come in here, don't they? Well, I'll carry it to you. I, when I walked out, I told on him. <laughs> I said, Mr. Wright, that guy in there said that, that, they, that you just let anybody come in here. He goes, don't worry about it, Junior. I'll take care of it. Because you know what? I'm not just anybody and neither are you. You're a child of God that God has called to do great, great things. So Mary comes to this place and she says, you know what? I want to know how it's going to be. She says, you know what? It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the Holy Spirit that's going to empower you and do you with power and the wisdom of God and everything that you need to be. So then, let, and then he says this to her. He says in verse 36, and listen, your, your, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is now the sixth month of, with her who is called barren. So the way I look at it is this. You need to look at it like this. The God we serve is no respecter of persons. Peter says it in the book of Acts. What God will do for one, God will do for the other. What God did for them, what difference are you from anybody else? When I would sit in that classroom, I look at that teacher up there teaching in a, in, in a lecture class, and I would say, I'm going to be a teacher, junior, not the, not the Alvarado instructor, not the Alvarado professor. I used to write it down, and I would look at it and say, what difference is that dude from me? Then the better thing, I'm better than him probably because he don't even serve God, and I serve God. God will give me the wisdom to do with it. So, so what's the difference in there? He is no respecter of persons. What God does for one, God will do for the other. What God did for Mary, come on somebody, she was a nobody, but God blessed her. God chose her. God chose Elizabeth. God chose, come on, Zechariah. And they weren't perfect people. Unless you're perfect. My son... Nate, when he was little, he would strike out all the time and he would start crying. And I had to tell him one time, you know, listen, you're not perfect. There was only one per perfect person. That was Jesus and you're not Jesus. <laughs> but then he tells us in verse 37, Luke 137 says, For with God, nothing is ever impossible. And no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. For with God, nothing, not a thing, is ever impossible. Come on. For with God, 
Nothing is ever impossible. And no word from God. He tells Isaiah that his word shall not return to him void. It will accomplish that which he sent it to do. The word of God. He was talking about Jesus. He accomplished what he sent him to do. He is the word. For no word from God shall be without power or impossible of fulfillment. You need to stand on it. You need to see what he did for Elizabeth. When Jesus shows up, when God shows up after 400 years, the first thing he shows up and he starts exemplifying, he starts showing himself in what area? He starts showing himself as a God of the impossible. That's how he starts out. Because in everything in the book of Luke, that's, that's the book where, where he barely, so Mary, that was like four months after they hadn't heard nothing for 400 years. So think about it. When God shows up at the very beginning, what is he saying? He says, I want to show you and I want you to always believe that I am the God of the impossible. And that I'll use anybody that I choose to use. And nobody is exempt. Come on, somebody. And then he tells us in verse 38, and Mary said, behold. And Mary said, behold, I am. Mary said, behold, I am the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be done to me according to what you have said. And the angel left. See, the handmaiden was the poorest of the poorest. The handmaiden was the least of the least. And Mary, Mary identifies her in true humility. Somebody say humility. Mary identified herself as humble. Mary identified herself as, 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 you know, nothing other than just being obedient to God. And she says this. She says that, you know what, that I am the handmaid. Let it be done to me according to what you have said. Once again, Zechariah 4, 6 says, for he said to them, this is the word, the Lord of Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. It's not by our gifting, it's not by our talents, it's not by this, it's not by that, but it's by the spirit of God. Mark 10, 27 says, and Jesus looked at them and he replied, with people it is impossible, but not with God. God makes all things possible. Luke 18, 27, and Jesus responded, what appears humanly impossible is more than possible with God. For God can do what man cannot. Man, you know, there's a new Spider-Man movie out. And I heard them say that it was really good. Desi said she wanted to see it twice. But the God that we serve, is beyond Superman and Spider-Man and, and every other thing that we could think of. He is. We just need to believe. Mary's believing response was to surrender herself. Maybe going into the next, next year, you need to surrender yourself. You need to surrender yourself to God as his willing servant. She experienced the grace of God, God's grace. Even though she didn't deserve it, he still gave her. She believed the word of God. Therefore, she could be used by the spirit of God. So you and I need to, need, need to experience that grace and understand the grace that God gives us. We need to believe the word of God. And when we believe the word of God, then the spirit of God can use us. And then she simply trusted God. You know, maybe you've been doing everything that you've been doing on your own strength. Maybe coming into this year and the Christmas message is God saying, you know, there's a lot of impossibilities there, but why don't you let me take over them now? Let me walk in them. Matthew 1.18 tells us this, and we wind down with this. Matthew 1.18 tells us, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. She was four months pregnant. And then in verse 19 it says, and Joseph to whom she was engaged. 
Joseph didn't know that she was pregnant until she was four months pregnant. Because remember when she goes with Elizabeth? God speaks to her. And for whatever reason, they believe that Elizabeth was her cousin. So for whatever reason, she goes to Elizabeth. When she walks into Elizabeth's house, the baby John that was inside of her leaps. And spirit to spirit, they hit. She stays with her up until like her fourth month. And then she goes home. And she goes home and she has to tell her husband to be, I'm pregnant. I give this guy a lot of credit. You gotta, you gotta give Joseph, he, you gotta, we gotta give Joseph a hand clap almost, man, because you know, you know, in those days, if if you were found to be in adultery, the husband, they had a right to murder you. You would stoned to death. So four months into her, her, her pregnancy, Joseph finally finds out. They live in a little town. They live in a little vario, if you want to call it that. And Joseph, the Bible says, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man. He did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly because he was the only one that knew. Nobody knew that she was pregnant. So he's like, you know what, I'll just walk away and leave it alone. Can you imagine his heart was broken and, and everything else, wondering, this girl messed up on me, man. Come on, man. This girl went out on me. This girl got pregnant. And we're supposed to get married. Everything's all set. My friends all know. My family all knows. We got the place ready to have the, the party and everything else. The Bible says, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him once again in his dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son. And you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. And she will give birth to a son. And they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. Verse 24 says, When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. You got to give him a lot of credit. You, you know, there's some things that don't make sense with God, but you got to believe him anyway. There's some things that are out of this place that make no sense whatsoever, but you got to believe in him anyway. There's a story in, in, in as Jesus grows and he gets older and, you know, he only, he only walked for three years and ministered and did a bunch of stuff and, and he showed himself as the miracle worker. Nobody never served him. He always served the people. He washed their feet. He healed them. He went to the blind, to the leper, to everybody that was broken. That's what Jesus did. That's why God sent him. But there's one point where, where Jarius, uh, he goes to Jesus and he says that his daughter's sick and she's dying. And then the woman with the issue of blood comes and she gets in the way. When he's on his way to go do, help out Jarius for his daughter. And the woman of the issue of blood comes in the way and all that takes place. And after, at the end there, the Bible says this, that in verse 35, Mark 5, 35 says, While he was speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue house who said, Your daughter is dead. Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher or Jesus any further? They came with a negative report. They came and said, leave him, don't even, don't pray no more. Don't, don't, don't go through that no more. I know you did a prayer. I know you said this. I know you were believing here, but leave it alone because she's dead. Don't, don't, 
pursue that anymore. Don't go after that anymore. No, why, why? The devil is a liar. And he'll bring arguments into your mind and he'll tell you that forget about it. But Jesus overheard them. And the Bible says that Jesus overheard. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler in the synagogue, do not be afraid. Only believe. Only believe. I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep believing. I don't know about you, but I'm going to keep walking by faith. I don't know about you, but I'm going to believe that the prayers that I prayed, that my wife and I have prayed for over 30 years, have been heard in the presence of God. We're going to keep believing. So after 400 years, the first thing he tells us is this, that we are to believe in the God of the impossible. When he shows up in the book of Luke, it's all about the impossible. But you know what? When it's time for him to die, you know what he taught us? What did he, what did he show us at the end? The biggest thing I believe when I read the scriptures that he taught us, Tim, was that believe in the God of the impossible. Believe in the... See, when you ain't got nothing, when you're up against the wall, and there ain't no way out, you better know the God of the impossible. You better know that God could use you too. You better know that God could change it around. My God, I say that I know God. You know why I can say that I know God? Because I've seen him do what only he could do in my personal life. That nobody could do for me. Nobody. Teresa couldn't do it. Nobody could do it for me. So that's how we say we believe God and the God of the apostles. And then when he closes, what did he show us? The two main things that he teaches us at the beginning, at the end is servanthood. At the end he says, I served. Apostle Paul says, I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I finished my race. Jesus says, he washes the disciples' feet. A few days before he dies, he served. He loved. This, I believe, is the heart of God. So, Mary said yes, yes to God, yes to the impossible, yes to the plan of God. The Christmas story is filled with miracles from the beginning to the end. The wise men see a miraculous star in the sky and they travel to Bethlehem and you'll hear that on Sunday morning. The angels sing to the shepherds. <laughs> why, why did they go to the shepherds? They were the, they were the, 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 the outcasts. They were they were the nobodies, the shepherds were. They weren't even welcome in the city because of the smell. They lived out there with the shepherds. But the angels go to the shepherds. The old woman gives birth to a son, which is Elizabeth. The virgin gets pregnant, which is Mary. The wicked king kills all the babies in Bethlehem except the one baby he wanted to kill. The baby and his parents are warned in a dream of the king's evil plan and escape to Egypt in the nick of time. So once again, the Christmas story is filled with miracles from beginning to end. And the miracles are your miracles and they're my miracles. God is into doing the impossible in our lives. Come on. Come on, let's give him a big hand clap. Woo! I want to encourage you guys that this is a really beautiful time in all of our lives. I know we get busy. We're going to spend some time with our kids in the next few days. But just know, hear the word of the Lord. And I really encourage you, going into this next year, we're going to start a fast on the 3rd of, of, of January. We're going to, I'm going to talk about all that next Sunday and the Sunday after, the last service of the year. And then we're going to go into January, and we're going to just tighten it up. Come on, somebody. And we're going to get our spirits, man, strong up there in that, that place. You know, it, your walk with God, it could go like this. Amen. And, and, and maybe you're down here, but we're going to start out our year. We're going to go through a 21-day fast, and I encourage you guys. We'll give you guys instruction on that if you want to do it. And then um, if you have medical issues, I encourage you to, and you want to do it, talk to your doctor. And then we're going to have a conference at the end of the month. Uh, we have Pastor Toyin on a Wednesday night, prophetic voice. 
We have Pastor Jason Lozano on a Friday night. And then we have Saturday morning, Pastor Jason and another friend of mine out of up from up north will be here with us Saturday morning. So we're going to start the month off strong. Amen? So I encourage you guys to start gearing yourself. Eat all the tamales that you want now and all the candy and everything else. First of the year, we're going to tighten it up and we're going to become, we're going to have prayer and we're going to just get back ready for another year because God's not done with any of us. So we have today our banquet. We want to encourage you guys once again to get involved. And Wednesday night, we're going to have a service Wednesday night and we'll probably have some some hot chocolate and some stuff for you guys. And I want you to come out, just get our hearts there ready. We're going to wind up, we'll go directly once again into the Christmas. And then Saturday morning, uh, the service will all be online, okay? We'll start at 7, Vico, then uh, we'll run it again at 9, and maybe at 11. We can just put it on again and let it play. And then for those of you that have family over, turn it on. And I'm just going to walk through the, the Christmas story is what we're going to do. It's not going to be nothing deep. It's going to be walking through the Christmas story. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for each individual that's here tonight, this morning. And we, we thank you. We thank you, Jesus, for, for who you are in each one of our lives. Say this with me. Say, Father, I come before you in Jesus' name. And I believe that Jesus, that you died, but on the third day, you rose again for me. So Jesus, I receive you into my heart as the Son of God. And I thank you for forgiving me of all of my sins in Jesus' name. Come on, and the church said amen. Come on, let's give them a hand clap. Well, I hope I see you on, uh, on Wednesday night. Try to make it on out Wednesday night. God bless you. Have a good day.